I want to talk to you this morning about spiritual gifts. Spiritual gifts, there's a lot of uh, uncertainty surrounding them, but before we ever get to that, I want to start with just this phrase. It's simple and it's sometimes misconstrued or misunderstood, but the phrase is this, you are anointed. Turn to the person next to you and say, I am anointed. Turn to the other person next to you and say, you are anointed. Now, a lot of times when it comes to anointing, we think of some crazy televangelist who will give you a free bottle of anointing oil for any gift that you give to his ministry, uh, you know, for some kind of crazy prayer shawl. Um, That's not the kind of anointing we're talking about here. In, In the Bible... If you are a believer in Jesus Christ, if you have believed on Jesus Christ to be your Lord and Savior, if he's forgiven your sins, you've been saved by grace through faith in Jesus, then you are anointed. And I'm not talking about Jesus accidentally knocked over some heavenly bottle of olive oil all over us. I'm talking about you have been given the gift of the Holy Spirit. At salvation, the Holy Spirit comes into your life and you have been anointed by by the the, the giving or or the the filling of the Holy Spirit in your life. There are so many things happening at salvation that we're just completely clueless of. This is one of them sometimes that we just don't understand. But we are given the gift of the Holy Spirit in our lives. The Bible says as a deposit guaranteeing our eternity with him in heaven someday. If you are a renter, sometimes you'll be asked to put down a security deposit on the apartment that you want to rent. This is setting it aside, reserving it for you so that when you are finally able to move in and start making monthly payments on it, it, you know, it's yours until that happens. Well, God is saying the Holy Spirit is guaranteeing your place in heaven with him until eternity actually comes to pass. So you have been anointed by the presence of the Holy Spirit. This isn't just my opinion about it. The Bible speaks to it in several places. We're just going to read one this morning. It's in 1 John chapter 2, verse 20, and this is what it says. But you have an anointing from the Holy One, and all of you know the truth. And you're like, well, wait a second. I just got out of bed this morning. I don't know much of anything. If you know Jesus Christ, then you know the truth. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no man comes to the Father but by me. Jesus is truth. Truth has a name. The name of truth is Jesus. If you know Jesus, then you know truth. And you've been, uh, you've been anointed by the Holy One. This is just one of two places in, in 1 John chapter 2 that talks about an anointing the believers have. So if you are a believer in Jesus Christ, it's not a question of if you have the Holy Spirit. It's just it's, 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 the, the Holy Spirit is in you. The question becomes, how is he working in you? How has he gifted you to use you for the, to the capacity that God has created you for? As, as a Christian, it's not a question of whether or not you have the Holy Spirit. It's not a question of whether or not you have spiritual gifts. It's simply, what are they? How can I identify them? And how can I use them to glorify God? Because God does not gift you for your own glory, for your own purpose. He gifts you so that you can benefit the body of Christ called the church. Not a building, the body of Christ. We are a church not because we meet in a building, but we're a church because we gather together. Um, that's what that means. But I want to talk about spiritual gifts. A lot, there are a lot of people who will go online and they'll find spiritual gift surveys and assessments and they'll, they'll download it and they'll take this test and, and it'll go through all these different things. It'll tell you, ask you all these questions to tell you what your primary spiritual gift is and, and you know, your secondary spiritual gift and, and you know, maybe your third or fourth. But here's the thing. In the Bible, there is not one all-inclusive list of every spiritual gift that exists. There, that, that list does not exist. There are three primary places in the Bible where you can find lists of spiritual gifts. Those places, in case you're wondering, are in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and in chapter 14. Uh, so 1 Corinthians 12, 14. Then there's also Romans chapter 12 and Ephesians chapter 4. These are the, are the places where you pro- will predominantly find lists of, of spiritual giftings. But in these lists, not all lists contain the same attributes or the same giftings. There are some lists that contain different giftings that other lists don't include, and, they're, they're, and, and vice versa. So there is not one place in the Bible where you can find an exhaustive list of every gift that God gives to his people. It just it doesn't exist. This is why I, I'm not a huge fan of spiritual gift assessments and surveys, because here's what I believe. I believe that God uses us in our specific time, in our specific generation, and with, with all different kinds of gifts and abilities, some that, that are biblical. There, there are some giftings that, that you will and I will have that are straight from the Bible that you can find biblical examples of. However, there are some people who are gifted to understand and use technology that, 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 that is so far and above other people that it's clear that God has gifted them in that arena. You're not going to find anything about technology in the Bible, though. You're not going to find in Romans chapter 12, God saying, I beseech you therefore with the gift of computers. Go and compute. It doesn't exist. You won't find it. 
There are absolute spiritual gifts that exist in the Bible that, that many of us will possess. There are also spiritual gifts that are not listed in the Bible. This is why there's not one exhaustive list that says you will have one of these, and if you don't have one of these, then you don't belong to God. That doesn't exist in the Bible either. God will use us in our specific time, in our specific place, in our specific generation for the purpose that he has created us for. And some of our giftings will, will be giftings that you can find scriptural backing for, but other giftings and, and, and just affinities that God has given you and passions and things that you just excel at, they may not necessarily appear in the Bible, but that doesn't mean they're any less a gift from God. So I want to talk about spiritual gifts. I want to talk about five ways that we can discern our spiritual gifts. Five ways. So if you're a note taker, you're going to want to write these things down. And if you're not a note taker, you're going to want to write these things down. They're, they're beneficial. They, they only exist to help you and to aid you. And, and so number one, when it comes to helping us discern what our spiritual gifts are, number one is a spiritual gift gives unusual effectiveness in a responsibility given to all believers. Is that up on the screen? All right, leave it there. A spiritual gift will give you an unusual effectiveness in a responsibility given to all believers. There are certain things that all believers are called to do. For instance, every single one of us are called to serve. Every single one of us are called to give. We're all called to evangelize. We're all called to pray for others and to pray for healing. We're all called to bear each other's burdens. We're all called to trust God, to give encouragement, to exhort people. Every single believer in Jesus Christ is called to do these things. A spiritual gift, however, is a specific and unusual effectiveness at one of these things. Now, here, let me tell you, as, as a man who's been married for nearly seven years now, and as a dad uh, for you know, a little over a year now, I can tell you my spiritual gift is not mercy. It's just not. When one of my boys falls down and skins their knees, I say, get up and walk it off. I'm just, I'm not mom. It's not my thing. Now, it doesn't mean that I'm not called to be merciful. I recognize that as a deficit in my life. I, I recognize that as an area that I need to pray through and be merciful on. I'm still called to. Just because my spiritual gift isn't mercy doesn't mean I'm not still called to be merciful. Every believer is called to do certain things within the Bible. A spiritual gift, however, will begin to show certain effectiveness or, or certain giftedness at certain things. Um, some of you may excel at the gift of mercy. Some of you are extremely merciful to others. And you have just, just that, that gift to, to sympathize with others and, and to feel their pain and to hurt with them and to bear their burdens. And that's just, you know, just because that's not my gift doesn't mean that I'm not called to do those things also. This is something that those of us who do understand spiritual giftings, we oftentimes misunderstand this back aspect of it. We think that just because that I'm not gifted in that particular arena means that I'm not, I don't have to do those things. That's simply not true. Every believer is called to do the things that the Bible calls us to do. A spiritual gift, however, just shows that we are gifted in this area and unusually effective at it. So a spiritual gift gives unusual effectiveness and a responsibility given to all believers. We're all called to these things. Some of us will be better that others than others at certain things. Number two is, is this. We discover our spiritual gifts as we actively pursue these responsibilities. I just rattled off a few of these responsibilities to serve and to give and to love and to bear each other's burdens and to pray for one another and to encourage one another. We're every believer is called to do these things. But we are best going to best understand and discover our spiritual giftings as we do these things. You're not going to discover what your spiritual gifts are and you're not going to have a special effectiveness at a certain thing if all you ever do is stand there with your arms folded and saying, God, show me, hello, where are you, God? Gift me now. Hello. Show me. Where are you? Let me, let me give you some scriptural evidence for this. In Acts chapter 13, verses 1 through 3, there, there's something happening in, in the book of Acts. There's something happening in this city called Antioch. Antioch is, is where Christians were first called Christians, and it was actually a derogatory term. It was kind of, of a slang for a Christ follower. In, in the same way that we might call someone a munchkin is a little person, a, a Christian is a little Christ, and it was a derogatory term. And it was for, Christians were first called Christians in Antioch by, by people who didn't have any use for Christians. 
But in spite of all that, there was something major happening in the city of Antioch. There were hundreds and thousands of people converting to this new, new religion called Christianity. These believers in Jesus Christ who believe that Jesus Christ is the Lord uh, and then the Savior of all and that he died on the cross for our sins and that if we would put our faith and trust in him, that he would save our lives, he would forgive us our sins and, and that we'd be given this gift called the Holy Spirit. And all this is happening in the church at Antioch. And then we get to chapter 13 and Chapter 13, verses 1 through 3 says this. In the church at Antioch, there were prophets and teachers. Barnabas called Simeon, Barnabas, Simeon called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manian, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. And while they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, okay, while they were worshiping the Lord, while they were doing what every believer had been called to do, while they were doing everything they'd been called to do. We're all called to worship. It doesn't matter if if you're a man or a woman or black or white or Indian or some other. It doesn't matter if you're rich or poor. If you're a believer in Christ, you're called to worship. And and another, they're also fasting. And and this is one of the spiritual disciplines that we often lack. Well, that's that's for other people. You don't understand how much I love food. I need food. I mean, God created me to need food, so I'm just going to eat food. Don't, Don't worry about fasting. But fasting is still a spiritual discipline that we've been called to do especially in times of, uh, of uncertainty when we're trying to discern a word from God and we're trying to understand what our next step may be, when we're trying to gain clarity on, on our next step, when we're trying to get understanding when we're praying for something specific. One of the best things in the world we could do to eliminate distractions to better hear from God is to fast. Sometimes it's from food. Sometimes it's from a, a specific technology or a social media source that eats up all your time. But to fast for this, not forever, but for a time, is going to give you the opportunity to hear better from God because you're not dealing with other distractions. These guys were doing the things that all believers had been called to do, and while they were doing the things that all believers called them to do, the Holy Spirit said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. And so after they had fasted and prayed, after they had done everything that all believers had been called to do, we're all called to fast at times, we're all called to pray continually, after they had done the things they had been called to do, they sent these guys off. So go back to point number two. We discover, we discover our spiritual gifts as we actively pursue those responsibilities. Those responsibilities are the things that every believer in Christ has been called to do. We're all called to give encouragement. We're all called to speak a word of truth to somebody who's going down a wrong path. We're all called to evangelize, to tell other people about Jesus. We're all called to worship. We're all called to fast at times. We're all called to pray continually. As these guys were being obedient in the things that every believer was called to do, as they were doing the general things, the Spirit gave the specific thing that they had been called to do. This is how the Spirit works. This is how God works. This this is just one example, one biblical scriptural example of of God working in this way. But this is how God works time and again in the Bible. As people are moving towards him, he steers them. On two different occasions, I've literally brought a bicycle on stage and I've ridden it from one point to the other, trying to demonstrate for us that as we gain some spiritual momentum by pedaling towards Jesus, God is going to be the one who's going to steer us in the direction we ought to go. Now, most of us don't ride a bike every single day. And so what this means literally for us is that as we get into the word of God, as we pray continually, as we do the things that we know we ought to do, as, as we have a cheerful attitude, as we are joyful and kind and compassionate and joyful and patient and, and, and we, we have peace, as we do these things, the spirit of God is going to steer us. How does he steer us? He does it, in the book of Proverbs tells us, through our thinking. And he's going to provide thoughts and guide us and steer us in certain directions. This only happens, though, as we have momentum moving towards Jesus. And that's our responsibility. It's our responsibility. God God is not going to, God will occasionally move us into action. I'm not going to say never. He will occasionally, but by and large, God is going to wait for you to move and get some spiritual momentum towards him before he is going to steer you in the direction that he is going to go. Some of us are sitting around praying, God, who should I marry? What school should I go to? What job should I take? Should we start a family now? Should we do... a lot of times those questions aren't going to be answered until you start moving towards God in other areas of your life that you completely neglected them in. We discover our spiritual gifts as we actively pursue responsibilities that Christians are called to. This is, this is just the truth of the matter. This is how it works continually. God steers moving ships. He's the rudder that directs the path, but the rudder is only effective when the ship has some momentum moving forward. Number three, spiritual gifts usually come to light at the intersection of passions, abilities, 
and affirmations. Let me, let me demonstrate this for us real quick. Is it okay if I go classroom on you guys for a second? Thank, thank, thank you. I appreciate your permission to do that. I'm going to do it anyway. So just, just, you just put your, get your panties out of a bunch. Here we go. Okay, passions. We all have things that we're passionate about. Some of us are passionate about music. Some of us are passionate about boys. Boy, and some of us are passionate about girls. Some of us are passionate about our jobs. Some of us are passionate about our spouses or our families or our kids. Some of us are passionate about sports. The Royals are in the World Series. I'm excited about that. I think that's pretty awesome. We all have passions. We all have passions. So I'm going to write passions right here. We all have passions. Spiritual gifts usually come to light at the intersection of passions. We all are passionate about something. It may not be what everyone else is passionate about, and that's perfectly fine, but we all have passions. But then there's also abilities. We all have abilities. Sometimes our abilities are, sometimes we're passionate about our abilities. If you're a musician, chances are you're passionate about the ability you have to play an instrument. And there's nothing wrong with that. You ought to be passionate about your abilities. God has given you that ability and it exists for a reason. That's a good thing. Absolutely. But sometimes our abilities and our passions are different. My father-in-law, for instance, is a f fantastic mechanic and he was passionate about it for a long time. But as he went on, his abilities to mechanic have somewhat diminished, not because he's not passionate about it anymore. He still has the ability to mechanic, and he still likes cars and tractors and stuff, but he's got a bad back and a bad neck that really hamper him in his ability to do these things. So sometimes our passions and abilities, sometimes they're the exact same things, but sometimes they're entirely different. But then here's the last one, and we're talking about affirmations. There are, and here's, here's the thing, affirmations don't come from you. You can't really affirm yourself effectively. If you can, that's a little odd. Affirmations come best when someone else notices a specific gifting or a specific uh, calling or something that you really excel at. So, so when somebody affirms you by saying, hey, you're really good at that, that's, that's an affirmation. Spiritual gifts come at the intersection of passions and abilities and affirmations. So that means that this area right here is our spiritual gifting. It's not a big area. It's not a huge area. There, you will have passions outside of your spiritual giftings. You will have abilities outside of your spiritual giftings, and you will have affirmation outside of your spiritual giftings. That's fine. That's good. But you are gifted specifically at the intersection of where your passions, abilities, and affirmations collide. If, if you are passionate about something, and you happen to be good at it, and somebody has affirmed you in it, chances are you have been gifted by God in that area for that specific purpose to accomplish whatever it is that God has created you for. That's where our spiritual gifts come to play. There's, there's this passage in the book of Acts, chapter 22, and verse 3. Paul is on trial for being a Christian. He's on trial for performing miraculous acts in the name of Jesus Christ, for healing people, for preaching the name of Jesus. And he's going to be uh, ultimately killed for his, for his faith in Jesus Christ. But in Acts chapter 22, he's just on trial. And this is what, what it says in Acts 22, verse 3. Paul's going to give us some insight into him, and then I'm going to extrapolate from there. It says, Then Paul said, I am a Jew, born in Tarsus of Cilicia, but brought up in this city. Under Gamaliel, I was thoroughly trained in the law, of our fathers and was just as zealous for God as any of you are today. So Paul is going to give us, he's given us a little history in his life. He was born, he was raised a Jew. That means that he would have progressed through little boy Jewish school where initially you're going to memorize the first five books of the Old Testament, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. He's going to commit it to memory and be tested on, on his application, not just his ability to remember word for word all five books of, this, uh, of, the, of the Bible, the first five books, every single word in order and the way it goes. Some of us, our minds are blown just trying to think about that because we have trouble memorizing you know, the, last, the last thing your mom told you to do when it came to just you know, doing some chores. But these kids were called to memorize this, and they were tested on it. From there, you go on to not just memorizing the first five books, but now you're also going to commit to memory all the prophets. 
That's pretty significant. You're going to memorize all the prophets. And, and, and so from Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, and then you're going to memorize the rest of it, that's, that's significant because now you're going to basically have the entire Old Testament committed to memory. And they're going to be tested on it. Not just tested on their knowledge of it, but their application of it. Once you graduate from there, then you're going to then get going to the third level of schooling where you're going to approach a Jewish rabbi. And this, this rabbi is then going to quiz you and test you and, and see if you're worthy to follow in his footsteps. To make it through all three stages of Jewish school is significant. Not many young boys did that. Paul did. To make it through all, all three levels, you're going to have to be passionate about law and history. You're going to have to have some abilities as far as memorization abilities to make it through all these things. Not just memorization abilities, but critical thinking and how to apply scriptures in certain situations that are unique. And so he has passions and he has abilities. And then, and then Paul shoots for the moon. He he approaches this man named Gamaliel. If there was any kind of hall of fame for Jewish rabbis, Gamaliel would be at the top of the list. This man was one of, if not the most respected rabbi to have ever walked the face of the earth at this particular time. Jews respected him. Those who weren't Jews respected him. He was knowledgeable. He was wise. He applied scriptures. God clearly blessed this man with wisdom and knowledge. Gamaliel ultimately affirmed Paul. But Paul had a greater affirmation on his life because Gamaliel affirmed Paul by saying, hey, you can follow after me. And Gamaliel didn't accept many students, but he accepted Paul. He was affirming his passions and his abilities. Some spiritual gifting is beginning to take shape in Paul, who's then Saul at the time. But then it all comes together one day on a Damascus road where Paul is traveling and a great light is shown. And Paul, who is very passionate about killing Christians, putting an end to Christianity, then becomes one. Not only becomes one, but preaches the name of Jesus Christ so that others may become Christians. Ultimately, is killed for being a Christian. So Paul had a special calling as an apostle and a teacher. He was affirmed by God as such. But God used his passions and his abilities and the affirmation that ultimately Jesus had on him to really bring about his giftings. And so his spe Paul's special calling as an apostle and a teacher coincided with his natural ability to think and to lead and to write. This guy went on to write over 13 books, at least 13. There's some discrepancy on who wrote the book of Hebrews, but he wrote at least 13 books in our New Testament. This is a prime example of how God uses our passions and our abilities and our affirmations, and at the intersection of all three of these lies our spiritual giftings. A lot of times you're going to be gifted beyond your spiritual gifting, but to work in the area that God has given you, you are to operate within your spiritual giftings. There, there's a lot to be said for strengthening your weaknesses. But what I see in the Bible a lot of times is that God doesn't really play to our weaknesses as much as he plays to our strengths. And sometimes our strengths are unnoticed or unrecognized or unaffirmed. Gideon, in the Old Testament, was the smallest member of his family and the least significant family and the least significant tribe of Israel. And yet God called him and brought about strengths that he didn't even know he had. God was gifting him and in passions and abilities and affirmations, and Gideon led an army of the Lord, just a few, few people in his army, against a massive army, and they had an incredible victory. And God used Gideon, someone insignificant, in a pretty significant way, by playing to strengths that Gideon didn't even know he had because he'd not been put in the position to understand those strengths yet. This is what God does. This is how he works in our giftings. This is how we understand how he's gifted us. Not necessarily by going online and taking some spiritual gift assessment, but using the unique situations, the unique circumstances that God has put us in to help us understand best how he's gifted us. Number four, spiritual gifts arise out of the unique ways that God writes our stories. Spiritual gifts arise. They come, they come to our understanding, our notice, out of the unique ways that God writes our stories. In Acts chapter 26, verse 16, I'll, I'll skip over there real quick. Again, this is the Damascus Road experience where then Saul, who wanted to kill Christians because he hated Christians, because they, they stood as a threat to Judaism, he's, he's on his road to Damascus to, to, to hand some orders out to, to kill Christians, and then he's, Jesus encounters Paul and Saul on the road, and this, this is what it says, the Lord replied, he's talking to Saul here, and he says, now get up and stand on your feet. I have appeared to you to appoint you as a servant and as a witness of what you have seen of me and what I will show you. So the point here is that spiritual gifts arise out of a unique way as God writes our stories. God was writing Saul's story in such a way that Saul would become Paul. 
that he would have this Damascus Road encounter where he's a great light shines on him and he's blinded by it, but he literally talks with God. The man who killed Christians now becomes a Christian and is going to lead others to become Christians. He's ultimately going to die for being a Christian. He's going to write most of the New Testament that we read that Christians have a better understanding of who Jesus is as a result of all this. And this happened as a, out of a unique way that God wrote his story. He said, I appeared to you to appoint you to this. God was orchestrating and writing his story in such a way that Paul was going to be able to understand how he was gifted and to what end he was gifted. Not only that, but spiritual gifts again arise out of the unique ways that God writes our stories. If you have your Bibles, you might flip over real quick to 2 Corinthians chapter 1, and, and I'll read verses 3 through 7. This is a letter that Paul wrote. Again, he was gifted by God in ways that, that he didn't even understand yet, but God used his unique circumstances to bring about his spiritual giftings. 2 Corinthians chapter 1 says this, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in our troubles so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves have received from God. Did, did you catch that? God comforts us. He allows us to go through grief. Sometimes he writes grief into our stories that he may comfort us, that we can use the comfort that we received as a result of the grief that we were in, that we may comfort others with the same comfort that we received from God for the grief that they're going through. God will allow grief and, and, and uncertain circumstances in our life so that we can relate to others and use the comfort that he gave us to comfort them. God uses our stories and the things that we view as insignificant and not very special and kind of a pain in the can. He uses these things and he molds them and shapes them and does it in such a way that we can benefit others as a result of what we've gone through. This is part of our spiritual giftings. For just as the sufferings of Christ flow over into our lives, so also through Christ our comfort overflows. If we are distressed, it is for your comfort and salvation. If we are comforted, it is for your comfort which produces in you patient endurance of the same suffering we suffer. And our hope for you is firm, because we know that just as you share in our suffering, so also you share in our comfort. What's he saying here? He's saying sometimes we go through things, and we experience God's presence in our lives, so that when somebody else goes through something else, our, our experiences now stand to benefit them, what they're going through. And now I begin to understand how I'm spiritually gifted. Sometimes it's, it's to encourage. Sometimes it's just to relate. Sometimes it's to bear their burdens. Sometimes it's to give them the comfort that God gave me. Sometimes it's just to point them to the God of comfort. Either way, God is showing us and directing our paths, directing us to our specific spiritual giftings so that we can accomplish the purpose for which we were created. Maybe you don't have a Damascus Road kind of encounter or experience. And, and your story, story is going to be different than the Apostle Paul's. Paul was called to be an apostle, and so he was going to be revealed doctrines and truths that he was going to write down in Scripture. And so he wrote these things down in letters to churches that became part of our Bible. The Bible's been written. You're not going to write the Bible, so that's not part of your story. That's Paul's unique story. But here's the thing about our God. Our God is a creator. He is not a duplicator. Why on earth would the God of the universe want to duplicate somebody else's story when he can create something new and significant and something that's never been done before in you and in me. Something that's significant in the Old Testament in the book of Esther. Esther was a woman that was getting ready to be used in, in a nation, a foreign nation, where the Israelites were, were taken in captivity. She is a Jew and now she is going to marry the, the king that they're in captivity to, that the Jews are in captivity to. And her uncle Mordecai, who is a Jew, who is encouraging during this time, he says to Esther, God has created you for such a time as this. We spend so much time as Christians praying for God to make us like Peter or Paul or Elijah or Elisha or Moses or Noah or Abraham or Isaac or Jacob. And you know, God made them and they did their thing and they were phenomenal. And we're so thankful we have a, a testament of who they were and what they did. But God didn't make me Moses. He made me Mark. In 2015, for a specific time, for a specific purpose, I don't need to pray to be Joshua anymore because, because the walls of Jericho have fallen. I don't need to bring down the walls of Jericho anymore. There are, there are walls in Wellington, not literal walls, but there's some figurative walls and some spiritual walls that are built. Walls of tradition. We've always done things this way and we'll only ever do things this way. Well, God wants to knock down some walls of tradition and get rid of some stuff so that he can come in and change some lives. God wants to knock down some walls of apathy. Well, I just don't care anymore, so I'm just not going to do anything. He wants to knock that wall down so that he can come in and show that there's a God of the universe who cares for you. And because he cares for you, you ought to care for those he cares for. 
God doesn't need me to be Joshua. He needs me to be Mark. And God doesn't need you to be Moses or, or, or Rahab or, 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 or you know, Moses' mom or Miriam or anyone. He doesn't need you to be anyone else in the Bible. They played their role. They had their time in history, and it was significant. And it's awesome that we have their testament. But God doesn't want you to be them. He's gifted you specifically and purposefully for this time, for such a time as this, in your neighborhood, at your job, in your corner of the world, so that you can shine the light of Jesus Christ through how he's gifted you in your schools, in your workplace, in your home, in your neighborhood, to your family, to your friends, to your coworkers, to your neighbors, so they can see that there is a God named Jesus Christ who is alive and well, and he's still working, and he still cares, and he still loves. Spiritual gifts arise out of the unique ways that God writes our stories. And it may seem insignificant to you that God is using something that you just happen to be good at. And you may not even understand why you're good at it. Maybe this message came to you today just to remind you that you're good at it because God created you that way on purpose. And not only are you good at it, but you're passionate about it and you've been affirmed in it for a reason because God is trying to show you, hey, I've gifted you in this area and I want to play to your strengths. Let's go do this thing. The last thing I'll say today is, is number five, and that's that the spiritual gifts, the Spirit of God works in our so-called secular vocations. The vocations isn't a word that we use often, but I used it very specifically. Uh, vocations means jobs. And a lot of times we think, well, if I'm not in actual ministry, if I'm not actually working at a church or on staff at a church, then I'm, then I'm just working some other job and God's going to use me in some other capacity somewhere else down the road. If you have believed that in your life, can I I please repent for you of that lie? Because there's nothing true about that. In fact, the Latin word that we get our word vocations from, the Latin word is voca, and it literally means to call. So our secular vocations, they're, they're our callings. It may seem insignificant. The job you work may seem insignificant to you. You may be working at McDonald's or sock and shelves at Walmart or, or, you know, something else along those lines. You may be working somewhere that seems like it's dead end and serves no purpose or no value. But the reality is, is that our jobs are part of our calling. We live in a blue collar town and most of us value a blue collar work ethic. And for those of us who do that, maybe a, a hero of the Old Testament that we ought to consider, one that most of us have never even heard of, is a man named Bezalel. Bezalel appears in Scripture in the book of Exodus, chapter 31. This is what we need to understand in the book of Exodus. The children of Israel have been brought out of slavery in Egypt. They're now wandering in a desert, but they need a place to worship God. And so they, God has them build this tent. It's called the Tent of Meetings. Portable churches are biblical. This tent would go with them everywhere. Uh, we're just doing what the Bible did. We're, doing, we're, we're kicking it old school. It's not new school, meeting at a theater. It's old school, it's portable. They had a tent, and they would, they would, you know, whenever they would pick up and move, they'd take this tent with them. But here's the deal. God's not going to meet in just any tent. This is the tent of meetings, and it's a significant tent. And this is what it says in Exodus 31. So for those of you who think that your job is insignificant, who think that your craft is just really has no value or purpose, this is what it says in, in Exodus chapter 31, verses 1 through 5. Then the Lord said to Moses, See, I have chosen Bezalel, son of Uri, the son of Hur, of the tribe of Judah. And I have filled him with the Spirit of God, with skill, ability, and knowledge in all kinds of crafts, to make aesthetic designs for works in gold and silver and bronze, to cut and set stones, to work in wood, and to engage in all kinds of craftsmanship. Wait a second, Mark. I thought that if I was going to be gifted by God that I had to preach or teach or... No! This guy was gifted by God to work with wood and metal and to craft things and to be artistic. That was his gift, and he did it with excellence. So much so that he was actually listed in the Bible. I'm not listed in the Bible, but this guy is. And he didn't preach, he just worked with wood and metal and was artistic. I came to tell somebody who works on an assembly line somewhere that just because you think your job is meaningless and pointless doesn't mean that God put you there for for no reason. He put you there to shine a light in a dark place. I used to wonder why I became a fireman. I went to school to be a fireman. I did it it for three years. And I remember as I was a a fireman in Garden City in in a department of, of close to 40 firefighters, I thought, God, why on earth would you send me to Garden City where I'm the only Christian on a fire department with 40 firefighters? He said, Mark, I want you to be a a light in a dark place. And so I did my best to live differently. And I didn't talk the way they talked. I mean, I didn't slam slam Jesus on him constantly. 
But I would talk about my faith when I got the opportunity. And I wouldn't use the language they would use. And I didn't, I didn't you know, joke around the way they would joke or use the course, any of those things. And you know what? Slowly, they began to notice that I was different. And they began to ask me questions. This was God using me in a vocation that seemed less than spiritual to realize that, man, my job is part of my calling. And I don't have to work at a church or for a church or volunteer in a church or, or anything like that. And I'm not saying don't volunteer for a church. I'm not saying don't work for a church. If that's what your calling is, then do it. But I came to tell somebody today that you need to go back to work on Monday and work as if you're working for the Lord because he put you there for a reason and he gifted you in that capacity for a reason to use you for the specific purpose that he created you. Does anybody get excited about that? That God, you don't have to be in ministry to be in ministry. I get excited about that. I get, I get real excited about that. So that means that I can minister even when I'm not up on stage preaching to people. I can minister to my boys even, even when I'm not at church. And I, I can minister to people in the community when I'm shopping at Walmart. I don't have to have the title pastor or, or, or musician or worship leader or youth leader. So I don't need that. It's not a required title in order for me to be used by God. Discovering your vocational ability is part of learning how the Spirit wants to use you. I want to read very quickly um, a paraphrase of something that Martin Luther, uh, the Reformation uh, master, said to us. Martin Luther observes that when the Lord answers our prayer for daily bread, he does so in a variety of ways. He gives the farmer the skill and ability to plant the seed and grow the harvest, grow and harvest the grain. He equips someone to build the road on which we transport the grain and someone who will drive the vehicle that carries it. He equips the engineer who designs the plant that, proce that processes the grain and the store owner who packs the bread for purchase and the advertise advertiser who alerts us to its availability. Occasionally, God has dropped bread directly from heaven, a.k.a. manna in the book of Exodus. Luther says, but... He typically provides in natural ways. Thus, God answers our prayer for daily bread by a multiplicity of vocational endowments. These vocations are the marks God wears, Luther says, in meeting our needs. Discovering your vocational abilities is part of learning how the Spirit wants, you, wants to use you on earth. You may be the guy that drives the grain truck, but you're a part of somebody getting some daily bread that they prayed for. You may be the guy that just works at a plant somewhere, but you're the one who's designing the plane that's going to get someone from point A to point B that's going to enable them to bring the word of God to someone who's never heard it before. You, you have a part to play, and that's significant. And this is what I want to end with today. I asked, I asked my, my friend John. You guys know John. John's going to come up here. John's our student pastor, and, and John's going to help me out with this illustration today. I want to read to you to wrap things up. This is where I'm going to land the message in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 12 and following. This is what it says. The body is a unit, though it is made up of many parts. Here's a body. It's a unit. Please observe the unit. Too much. <laughs> if we were all baptized by one spirit into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, slave or free, and we were all given one spirit to drink. Now the body is made up of many parts. I'm sorry, the, the body is not made up of one part, but of many. So John here has arms and legs and knees and toes and, and belly button, one belly button, and eyes and nose and mouth and many parts, lots of parts. We all get that, right? We see it. I'm a visual guy, so that's why I'm doing this. If you're not a visual learner, then just bear with me. Now the body is made up is not made up of one part, but of many. If the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, it would not for that reason cease to be a part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, it would not for that reason cease to be part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? But in fact, God has arranged the parts in the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. And if they were all one part, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, but one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you. And the head cannot say to the foot, I don't need you. On the contrary, those parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And the parts that we think are less honorable, we treat with special honor. And the parts that, we, that are unpresentable, we treat with special modesty. So I, I understand this best when I, when I can see this. And so this is John. Let's, let's, let's pretend, for instance, that John has some body image issues, okay? 
And not so much John, but it's really his hand. Let's say that John's right hand, it's a, I mean, it's a, it's a nice right, as far as right hand goes, this is the best right hand John has ever had. It's also the only right hand you'll ever have. And it, it performs its function well. But let's say that, for instance, his hand got sick of his elbow. I mean, as far as elbows go, John's hand thinks that John's elbow is a little bit too pointy. It's not as rounded as the hand would like it to be. The hand does not have the authority to say to the elbow, I don't need you, you pointy elbow. It doesn't have that authority. But here, here's the thing about the elbow, that the hand doesn't have the capacity to understand that without the elbow, the hand cannot be extended or moved in certain areas. The hand is at its most effective usage when it is able to extend itself and move itself around. If John's at a concert, his hand cannot do this without the aid of an elbow. You feel me? <laughs> Let's say John's nose had a problem with John's ear. Like his right nostril has had it with his right earlobe. And so the nose is saying to your ear, you're a little bit smaller than I would like you to be. I need you to grow a little bit. John's nose doesn't have that authority to say that to John's ear. It doesn't exist. John's nose can never say that to John. John's nose was designed by the God of the universe to smell, to not have an opinion about how the ear works. It's, it's designed to do what God designed it to do. That's all there is to it. So let me skip down to verse 27 for you real quick, okay? So we're talking about the body, and it says, Now you are the body of Christ, and each one of you is a part of it. You're the body of Christ. If you're a hand in the body of Christ, your gift is serving and helping and hospitality. You cannot look to the elbow, the guy who plays a part behind the scenes, and say, I don't need you. It's the guy doing his thing behind the scenes that enables you to do your thing up in front of people who, who, who maybe don't understand the use of the elbow, but they know, maybe, that maybe they don't even know that without the elbow, the hand is not effective. Maybe there are some hands here today who've been playing the comparison game, saying, well, I don't have their gift, or my gift is better than their gift. They all came from the same spirit. And if we're all the body of Christ and you're not using your part for the body of Christ, then what are you doing? It's not a question of whether or not you've been gifted by God. You've been gifted by God. If you're not using your gift, then what are you doing? Because your gift wasn't given for your glory. The hand wasn't given to John for the glory of the hand. I mean, it doesn't radiate beams of awesomeness. It's a nice hand as far as hands go. I prefer my hand to your hand, but I mean, ultimately, it's his. It's his hand. It's been designed to do a specific work. So many Christians get caught up in the comparison game. Well, I'm not gifted in their, the way they're gifted. And my gift's better, or, or they say my gift's better than their gift. I, I, I'm superior to them. No, man. We're the body of Christ. We've been gifted by the Spirit for a specific purpose in a specific time that we live in to be used by God for the glory of God to benefit his body, the church. Here's the thing. We're the body of Christ, but Christ is the head. So if Christ is the head, the body, let's say John's elbow had an itch. And so John's brain sent a message to his hand that the elbow itches. And so John were to scratch the elbow. Now, does the hand get all the glory for alleviating the itch? The hand's useless without the brain, without the head. As we are useless without Christ. Sometimes we walk around like we have the authority to say, I don't need the church. I can do this on my own. I'm going to use my gifts the way I think I had to use my gifts. I'm going to glorify myself in these things. I'm going to do what I want, when I want, how I want it. As if we have the authority to even say that. We look, at, we look at this analogy and we think, man, it is completely preposterous to think that a hand could say to an elbow, I don't need you. It is equally preposterous to us to say to the church, I don't need you. It is equally preposterous to say, I'm gifted, but I'm not going to serve the church. It is equally preposterous to say, I'm a Christian, but I'm going to try this thing without God. What right do you have to say that? As ridiculous as it is to think about my hand saying that, it is equally ridiculous for us who've been gifted by God and for God to say that I could do this life on my own. The Spirit exists to bring us together to benefit the body of Christ. He has gifted us and he's created us in such a way 
that we would be used to our fullest capacity by God, for God, and the time and the place that he's created us for. The band's going to come back up, and we're going to worship one more time together. My hope, my prayer, is that this brought some clarity to some of you who are struggling with this idea of, I know I'm a Christian, but I don't know how I'm gifted. Hopefully you'll understand that your passions and your abilities and your affirmations come together to help you understand what your spiritual gifts are, what your effectiveness is. But I also came to tell some Christians today who've been trying to do this life on your own, what are you thinking? I don't mean that in a condemning way. I just mean literally, what, like what's, what has led you to believe this? Because there's nothing biblical or scriptural about it. And when, called, when God calls us to be the body of Christ, he calls us to be the body of Christ for our benefit, for his glory, so that all of us can glorify him. And when God gets the glory, then we all benefit. So why are you doing life on your own? Why are you trying to figure this out by yourself? You weren't called to. You weren't created for that. Maybe you're here today and this idea of being part of a body of Christ sounds pretty attractive. You've never understood why church is necessary. You've never understood why Christians gather. And, and maybe this idea of being part of a body of believers sounds pretty attractive. Then for you, maybe, maybe your step this morning is, is to just put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. And to believe on him that he'll forgive your sins. That he'll give you a hope and a future. That he'll begin to bring to mind the giftings that he's given you. If you don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ and you'd like to start that today, it's, it's a pretty simple step. The Bible tells us that if we would confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, that we will be saved. It's a simple act. It's not incredibly easy to make him Lord of your life, though, because to call him Lord means that you give him everything. You relinquish your rights. To, to yourself and your decision and your glory and you say, God, I know exists for you and your glory and for your purposes and in this time for who you are, for how you gifted me to benefit your body. But in doing so, you gain a body of believers who exist to love you, to encourage you. You gain the gift of the Holy Spirit who will go with you and guide you. You'll never be alone again. You'll never have to sit and wonder if you're loved or valued or are significant. God has given you his very spirit to indicate to you that you are those things. You are loved and are valued and you are significant. And he's given you the spirit as a deposit, guaranteeing your place with him forever if you'll believe on him as Lord and Savior.